and welcome to today's webinar. And thank you for taking time out and being here today. I'm the host and my name is Ayoung. I am the Marketing and Educational Seminar Coordinator here at NeoBioTech. And this is Mira here. And hello and welcome again. And today's agenda is very simple. I will introduce our topic and the presenter. And also I will make an announcement right after the lecture in regard to uh, upcoming webinars and also watch previous webinars and how to receive your C credits. So please don't leave and stay until the end. And also stay connected with us on social media. Our Facebook page is right here, Neobiotech USA, and Instagram is Neobiotech underscore USA, and also YouTube channel is Neobiotech USA. So follow us and also see our most up-to-date information from our social media page. So today's topic is the part two of the how to complete a dental implant re restoration for beginners with Dr. Huang. And also we are strongly recommended to use the chat box to communicate with the host, ask technical questions, and we will have a Q&A session at the end. So please submit your questions through this Q&A box right here and Dr. Huang will answer it. So let's have Dr. Huang to start today's webinar. Good morning, Dr. Huang. How are you doing? Uh, good morning. Good morning, Dr. Huang. There you go. <laughs> good. How are you, everyone? How is everyone doing? I know we're all stuck at home with COVID-19 uh, going around. I hope everyone is safe. And I hope that we are able to open our offices very soon, especially here in Southern California, where it seems to be the hardest area to open. But um, since we had this opportunity to uh, share our time, I hope that I'm able to share some ideas that you might be able to use back in your practice, okay? So my lecture, I'm trying to uh, finish on time, so I'm gonna start right away. And then if anything is not um, clear, then you could ask me, at the end, or you can start asking me the question, asking me a question during my lecture when you think about the question, and I'll get to it at the end. Okay, so I'm going to go over how to complete a dental implant restoration for beginners. So I understand that there's a lot of you that are not beginners, so this is probably going to be a review, but maybe you'll pick up a few uh, good pointers. Okay, so I'm going to first start off with the. Uh, a little case, anterior immediate case that I've done in the past. So this patient came, is a young a female patient, came in with a root fracture of tooth number 10 uh, treatment plan. So she was referred to us. So our treatment plan was to extract number 10 and then do bone grafting and then immediate implant placement, do a post buildup on tooth number nine and do a porcelain layer crown on both number nine and 10. And also number 10, the implant is gonna be a screw retained uh, restoration. Okay. So this is how she presents. Uh, the, the temporary on number 10 actually broke when she came in. So what we did was we took an impression and uh, let her go home. We waited for the state plate to come in and this is how she presented. So I got her um, just numb around the area with infiltration to a atraumatic extraction here without lifting a flap. This is to preserve the blood supply to the area and make sure everything is cleaned out. I do the osteotomy, go through the sequence. I put bone graft and implant in there, put in a cover screw that you can't see on the left side. That's what I'm doing, putting the cover screw and that add, actually add a little bit more bone, okay? On the right side. Here it is, you can see the bone particulate sticking out. And then I put a collagen membrane and here um, I put a, a suture. I usually put in a PTFE suture, but at this time it was a suture. The assistant gave me a silk and she had it open. So I just ended up using it because I didn't want to waste it. But my preference is PTFE, okay? And so this is immediately after. You could see that I closed it and this is the immediate after X-ray. And I deliver a stay plate right after because it is a front tooth. Um, here it is, you could see through the state plate that there, you could see the suture still kind of showing through and the tissue is kind of blanched because I did do an infiltration in that area. Okay, I didn't give a whole block or there's really no block infiltration, really easy and quick. 
this is a patient coming back after healing a little bit. You can see that she's been on, on chlorhexidine for a while. That's why it's all stained. She's a good patient. So here it is. And actually the temporary on the number nine broke. So now we had to go back in and do a new temporary. So here you could see that I did a um, fiber post on number nine. Uh, it wasn't, there was no post before, but you could see that kind of light color translucent area toward the middle to the coronal is that uh, fiber post. And then it did a buildup. And then we did another temporary, a longer, uh, uh, long, long-term temporary on there while it's healing. And then you can see the tissue is healing beautifully. Nice carrot, nice tissue around tooth number or the implant number 10. And afterwards we did a tissue punch, put a healing abutment there and allow that to heal. She comes back and the tissue looks beautiful, very healthy here. No sign of any inflammation, everything looks beautiful. So we go ahead and take off number nine and reprep, clean that up and also put in a peak cap uh, transfer abutment on number 10 implant and cord number nine and we take an impression okay this is the impression with the peak cap on the number 10 which is on your left actually that white plastic piece is a peak cap component so this is how it is this is when she came in we tried in the uh, crowns you see the little blanching on number 10 on the gingiva um, and we figured it was gonna, we wanted to push that gum out a little bit. And you could see the position of the implant was toward the palate so we could have a screw retained implant. So if there's ever a problem with her crown or tissue or whatever, we could go back in and remove that crown easily and address any issues, okay? And so this is how she finished. And uh, we thought about recontouring the tissue, uh, the gingiva a little bit but she said she was perfectly happy with it. She's ecstatic, so she didn't want to do anything else. This is a final radiograph. On the left, the radiograph PA shows a little translucency on the uh, center of the crown. That's where the access hole was, okay? Um, and this is before, and this is how she finished, okay? All right, so that can be done. It's not that uh, difficult once you get uh, a few basic concepts. Okay, so I'm gonna go over the importance of proper implant restoration. Okay, um, the key point to this is understanding the differences between natural and implant teeth. Okay, there's obviously a difference. If you look at this, uh, the root form and size, you see in the drawing here on, um, that in the anterior canine and premolar, you could pretty much kind of gauge the size. What you wanna do is you wanna to try to match a similar implant to a similar size of the root of the area that you're working on. Uh, but if you look at the molar, uh, there's a discrepancy, right? So if you look at the molar, um, molar, if you look at the molar, you see there's a diff difficulty in the implant, okay? What that is, is with natural tooth, the mesial to distal width here is about 10 to 12 millimeter, okay? That's pretty broad. But with implant diameter, when you're putting an implant in the molar, you have four, you know, anywhere from four to six, even 3.5 sometimes we put in that. But you could put in wider, but there's even seven, eight millimeter implants, but those, you have to have enough bone. So in actuality, most of the time we're putting in four to six millimeter or five millimeters usually what I put in. So there is a discrepancy there. Okay, soft and hard tissue attachment, the most important difference here is the PDL in natural, natural dentition. That makes a huge difference on how the restoration functions and how our biology, our, our body functions, okay? And biologic width, you see on the left side, uh, which includes the junctional epithelium and connective tissue attachment, uh, we usually see that as here, it looks like about two millimeters or so, but Really, it's a, anywhere from two to four millimeter, okay? I always say three millimeters is what I always tell patients or, uh, or other people. And obviously there's quite a bit more uh, differences if we uh, delve into it more closely, but I think the main thing that you wanna look at is the periodontal ligament, 
okay, PDL is the main difference that's gonna affect it. And how that affects it is this way. The difference between implant and natural tooth is how it reacts to forces, how it reacts to vertical force. When a vertical force is placed on the crown, let's say a natural tooth, okay, natural tooth may move about 25 to 200 microns, okay? And that's due to the PDL, periodontal ligament space, that's right here, okay? It actually acts as a shock absorber and your tooth actually moves, obviously, right? But if you put a vertical force on an implant, implant moves five to 10 microns, maybe, okay? That's because it's osteointegrated, there's no PDL, okay? So the important thing here is never splint or bridge natural tooth to implant tooth. We get those questions a lot before, um, but I think nowadays people don't question it as much, but there are still people who ask, hey, instead of getting a, a long bridge or something, could I just get an implant and bridge it with a natural tooth? And no, you cannot do that. Um, it was done before, but there's an intrusion property that happens with natural teeth. You don't wanna do it. Okay, how about reaction to lateral force on a tooth, okay? When you have lateral force, there's a, a, a fulcrum where it bends. So where is the fulcrum of the uh, bending moment in implant and natural tooth? So on natural tooth, the fulcrum is gonna be positioned toward the apical one third of the root, which is down here. It's gonna rotate around that area. And this is, again, due to the PDL, because the PDL moves, the whole tooth moves. So the fulcrum is gonna be toward the apical third. And then implant, uh, there is no PDL, so it is around the crestal, okay? That's where the fulcrum is gonna be, right here. And that's gonna put pressure around the uh, implant crest right here, uh, crestal point. This can lead to, obviously, crestal bone loss, okay? So another thing about uh, crowns is the emergence profile, okay? This one on the left is, they're the exact same tooth, I just, on the right, I, uh, I contoured it because I didn't like the contour of the emergence profile. Here, we have over-contoured uh, um, uh, emergence profile here, highlighted in the red here, okay? And then here, I smoothed it to a, what I call an S-curve, okay? And this is what I want. So if you look at the left and right, uh, the left one, it's gonna cause pressure to the soft tissue. On the right, it's gonna allow the tissue to breathe and relax more. Um, this is a very important thing. Um, I call that the S sexy curve. It's really not standing for sexy, but it's actually the shape, S shape, okay? Um, this will affect soft and hard tissue reaction around that implant. Um, this I could go into this a lot longer, but with limited time, I'm not gonna be able to do that. But you don't want the overpressure, okay? Understanding implant components. Um, this can be kind of dry, but let's go through it. Okay, first of all, lab analog. It's used to transfer condition in the mouth to the lab model. So we're just transferring the implant location from the patient to a working lab model. So there's three basically different lab analogs you could have. You could have uh, solid abutment, okay? That's on the left. That's if you take an impression of the abutment in the patient's mouth after you place the abutment in the patient's mouth, okay? And then you have the O-ring abutment on the right. You do that for overdenture patients. Um, so you put the O-ring in the patient's mouth and you do that, and then you can transfer it with the O-ring abutment analog, okay? And then for everything else, you use a, a um, just a lab on our use, straight stock lag analog in the middle. It's for UCLA and other stock abutments. This is the one that I use almost exclusively, okay? So abutment selection. When factors for selecting abutments are restoration space, mesial distal space, inter-occlusal space is gonna determine what you're gonna select. Is it cement or screw retain and so forth? Soft tissue height is gonna determine what uh, uh, gingival cuff you're gonna uh, select. Implant position and implant angulation is gonna determine what kind of, all these things are gonna determine what abutment you select. Single or multiple, multiple fixture units, screw or cement retain prosthesis, okay? 
So abutment connection, there's healing abutment that looks like this. Solid abutment, this is one piece. There's no separate screw, it's one piece. There's a straight hexed abutment, so the bottom component is hexed. And then there's straight um, non-hexed abutment, okay? And then angled hexed abutment. There's also angled non-hexed, but I didn't put this in here. And there's also a thing called customizable abutment, where you could customize that abutment in the lab, okay? And then there's SCRP, which stands for Screw Cement Retained Prosthesis Abutment. If you look at the difference of that compared to the hex abutments above, the, of the, above that, the hex component is shorter. This will help in terms of um, uh, missed angulations, okay, when you're doing splinting and so forth, okay. And then you have ball abutments for overdentures, and then UCLA abutment, which are castable abutments, okay. And if you look at the Neobiotech catalog, they always have a page that describes all the components that they have. If you look at from the left to right, like a regular book, that's, this is how you read it. So you pick the fixture that you are using, which is on the left, and then you have, you could use a healing of abutment or a cover screw. That's the first part. And then next part, you gotta go with uh, uh, abutment, what kind of abutment you're gonna use, and that depends on the prosthesis. And then you choose the impression, uh, technique and then lab analog. Okay, so let's look at the abutment individually. Here you can see the abutment. When we talk about length of the abutment, it's a distance from the chamfer of the margin to the top of the uh, abutment. Okay, that's the length. And then you have the gingival cuff, which is the distance from the implant platform to the chamfer margin. And then you have diameter, uh, which is the diameter. Uh, abutment at the chamfer margin, okay? And chamfer margin, which is right here, you should, if you're doing a cement type or anything, actually, you want it to be 0 0.5 to one millimeter sub gingival for cement type or not even non-cement type. Um, but for cement type, you don't want it to be too deep because you want to be able to clean off the uh, uh, excess cement. So you don't want it to be like three millimeter sub gingival. Okay, that's what the main point is there. Okay. Solid abutment. Um, so this is mainly for cement retain. You can't do a screw retain because it's one piece. Okay. There is a six degree uh, taper on the uh, coronal portion. Okay. Ideal um, uh, taper. And then there's an anti-rotational uh, design into it to reinforce crown fit of a, um, to the abutment so the crown doesn't rotate. And then there's a abutment and screw are integrated into one piece. This is one piece, that's why it's solid, and uh, you only could do cement type here. And then there's a non-hex connection between abutment and implant fixture because this is solid. If you had a hex, you couldn't put this down. And then there's a 11 degree taper against the implant fixture, which creates a Morse taper, which is metal to metal taper that's really uh, tight. Uh, it minimizes screw loosening, creates a tight seal between the abutment and implant, okay? And then um, there's a hex, 1.2 millimeter hex on the top there. So you wanna, you can uh, prep these abutments when you should put it in there, but you don't wanna cut these down too much because if you uh, reduce the occlusal table too much, then you take the risk of obliterating the 1.2 millimeter hex driver. So you can't do anything with that, you can't tighten it or something, okay? Okay, and then there's uh, these um, standard abutments that come in hex and non-hex abutments. And you have abutment and screw are two separate pieces aligned for cement retained or screw retained restoration. So I don't use solid abutments anymore. Mine are all just stock regular two component stock abutment um, where I, I use it as a screw retained, okay? Um, there is a six degree taper on all of these for, uh, and then also anti-rotational slot. Um, and then whether you choose hex or not hex, okay? Hex is easily repositionable, okay? For a single tooth, it's really easy. And then non-hex compensates for 20 degree, two, 22 degrees of path of insertion. Mainly I use this for uh, doing splints, a bridge. If I'm doing a bridge, if you're, your uh, implant position is not, not going to be perfectly parallel, so it gives a little forgiveness there. Okay, 
And how do you take the impression for these? You take the implant level impression using transfer or pickup technique. Uh, the abutment level, if you want to take the abutment level impression, you use the same impression cap used for rigid, uh, rigid abutment. Okay. So hex or non-hex abutment. Hex abutments lock abutment into basically six anti-rotational positions at the implant abutment interface because they're this hexagonal, okay, the uh, connection there. Easily reposition back into the mouth and then for single crown, use hex abutment because you want that anti-rotational. Okay. Non-hex abutment, the main reason for non-hex abutment, once again, is to compensate for path of insertion correction and, and bridge cases. Okay, so the diagram on the right shows that you could be off 22 degrees and still use these non-hex abutment to get insertion path. Gold UCLA abutment, um, it's called the UCLA abutment because it was first uh, uh, tested in UCLA and developed there. Um, it's screw retained prosthesis. We use, usually use it for anterior a lot, um, for anterior screw retained custom abutment. So if you flare out the implant, then um, you, you have to make a custom abutment for aesthetics, okay? And it'll be cement retained. Uh, nowadays, we try to position the implant more palatally and to have it straight up and down and to make it retrievable. Okay, the top portion is the plastic, which is easily customizable. You can cut it and wax it up and so forth. Works well for anterior or posterior. The bottom part, the metal part, is actually a gold cylinder. It's gold alloy. Um, and you cast directly on this with gold, and you could only uh, cast gold with these, okay? And then uh, the impression technique is transfer technique or pickup technique at the implant level. Uh, there is hex and non-hex. Hex is for single and non-hex for bridge and also to forgive for misalignment up to 22 degrees of insertion path. And so gold, this is a, a, a fully casted gold crown. I used to do these. I love gold, but it's so dang expensive. We can't do these anymore. So if I'm casting a UCLA abutment, I don't cast the solid tooth anymore. I do a custom abutment casted, and then I make a, a crown on top of that. Um, but I did do these gold crowns a long time ago, and it was pretty heavy. Okay. So uh, when you're casting, this study by Kano, Binan, and uh, Bonfante, Curtis, it, it studied the effect of casting produces on screw loosening and UCL type of mud. What it showed is that in machine abutment, the retain, it retained significantly better, greater percentage of torque compared to cast abutment. Um, Casting procedure decreases the percentage of applied torque, which may influence final screw joint stability. This is, um, we're talking about the uh, connection between the abutment and the uh, implant. They used to make all plastic castable abutment where it's all plastic, uh, so you don't have to use gold. They use non-precious metal to uh, cast it instead of using gold. But, that's why, because of the study, this is why all plastic castable abutments are not recommended. I would say use a gold, which is machined uh, uh, hexed. It's going to fit much better. It's going to be much more retentive. So I don't think uh, Neobiotech even sells those non, uh, I mean, all plastic anymore. I think. I know they used to have it before. Okay, which brings us to O-ring abutments, okay? Um, this is for edentulous patients, very easy to do. Uh, and you have dalbo and O-ring, uh, rubber O-rings. Dalbo has a higher retentive force than O-ring. O-ring, there's different colors for different uh, uh, retention, so you could change those. The black ones are used always used for uh, lab purposes. Okay? And there's oh, yellow, pink, blue, and so forth, uh, different torque retention. <laughs> And then there's temporary abutment, um, which is used to make temporary crowns. And there's hex and non-hex for obvious reasons. And you could cut these down accordingly to uh, the size that you want. So here on the right, you can see I made a temporary crown. And this is an example 
of that crown. I had to do an immediate extraction and implant, and we didn't have a temporary ready, so uh, we made a direct temporary at the time of surgery. So I put the implant in, I put the uh, temporary abutment in, I took a pre-impression uh, of the tooth that we took out, and then I put in acrylic and um, made a custom, suck down, custom uh, uh, temporary right there. And in the temporary abutment where the uh, screw was, I put cotton pellet in there, so I knew I was gonna go in there to retrieve this out. So to protect that screw, I put cotton pellet. You could use cotton pellet or Teflon, but, uh, for temporary, when I'm just doing the initial, I use cotton pellet. So here, uh, I see the cotton pellet, I remove it and I take the thing out. And you can see the flash around and um, inside the gingival area, it's not smooth, so I clean that up. I build it up and then clean it up, polish it up, and I play it back in. This one, I did immediate bone grafting with a CGF. The thing that you see around the gingiva is um, CGF, concentrated growth rate factor, uh, PRF, okay? Uh, poncho technique, and this is the temporary, immediate temporization, okay? Okay, how about cement or screw type of uh, restoration? Okay. Advantages of screw retained restoration, main thing is retrievability. Um, in our practice, almost, we try to achieve 100% uh, screw retained restoration. There are few, very few cases that we do um, uh, cement retained. So almost 100% of our practice, uh, our implants are screw retained, okay, for retrievability. And it requires less uh, vertical height, um, minimum, you need minimum five millimeter, and it's very simple. Disadvantage of screw retaining restoration is that cost, if you're casting it, it's gold cost is more expensive. Um, Cumbersome during delivery, I really don't agree with that. Some people might find that, okay, but uh, I find it much easier. Unesthetic un access hole, you can see that, but access hole is usually seen in the posterior, and these days with the composite and so forth, it's pretty invisible. So I don't think that's a, a, such a big deal, okay. Unstable occlusion, they talk about how the, it's right at the center of occlusion, so it could be unstable, but I don't think that's a, a big deal, okay? Sensitive to fixture position and angulation. Yes, that's, if the angle of the implant is incorrect, then it might make it hard for you to put in the fixture, I mean, the crown restoration. Um, hard to obtain passive fit and multiple fixed, uh, fixture processes like bridge and stuff. Um, if you're using hex, it is. But if you're using non-hex, it's not that hard, okay? There's a 22 degree forgiveness, so you would use non-hex for multi-fixture splinting. Cement retained prosthesis, uh, we usually use it in the front for this kind of case, okay? Advantage of cement retained prosthesis, it's simple clinical procedure. It's just like crowning bridge that we do on natural teeth, it's cementing. Easier to, uh, to obtain passive fit, it's because there's a gap where the cement space is, so it's easier to fit. Aesthetic, yes, there's no hole. Cost effective, usually cost, lab cost is a little cheaper, okay? Disadvantage of uh, cement retained prosthesis requires more vertical space, minimum of six millimeters. This is because of the axial wall. We need retention for with the cement, so we need at least six millimeter of interocclusal space. Hard to remove excess cement, uh, yes. This is the main problem for long-term success, I think. And cement washout, uh, what we used to do is use temporary cement to make it retrievable, okay? Um, so we used to use temporary cement, but if we use that, then there's cement washout potentially, and people come back with crown out of their mouth and we have to re-cement it, okay? Difficult to separate, separate crown and abutment when screw loosening occurs. This is when you have a, a, a permanently cemented, okay? Uh, nowadays, if you want, you could try to, if the position of the implant is correct, just go through the crown and access the hole. This, so this is a, a cement removal. This is a study done before. Um, and what they did was 
they took six periodontists, uh, experienced periodontists, and simulated a clinical condition where it's cemented and the margin is 1.5 to 3 millimeters subgingival. And after they removed the cement, they looked at it, the connection with microscope 20 time uh, magnification. And what we find is that even the best of the periodontists, they're scratching up the uh, area and also um, the cement is then completely removed, okay? And so there's discussion about, oh, you don't use metal scalers against implants. Um, no, but the research has shown that it's better to use metal um, than plastic because the plastic uh, uh, scalers doesn't, aren't effective in removing the cement thoroughly. It's better to make micro scratches than to leave uh, large uh, cement in there. Okay? So here is excess cement on the left, and what it does is causes bone loss. Indication for screw and cement crowns. Screw retain, there's areas where you absolutely have to use screw retain and also absolute area where you have to use cement retain. So in cases where there's a mesial and distal position or angulation dis discrepancy, you would have to use screw retain. And then if there's a buccal lingual position or angulation discrepancy, it has to be cement retained. And this is gonna show you what happens. So if you have a mesial distal discrepancy in terms of implant position, if you look at the bottom uh, photograph here, the premolar, if you made that a cement type, you couldn't do it because there's not enough space for the, um, the crown and cement and the abutment in between that marginal ridge and that screw hole, right? So cement type is not possible. You have to do a screw retain, okay, and cast it. Right here. Okay, about buccal lingual position discrepancy. So if you look at the top right, you can see that the hole is coming out on the buccal. So if you made that screw retain, that hole would be coming out on the buccal. So in that uh, condition uh, situation, you have to make it a cement retain, like the bottom shows. Okay. Take home message about abutments. I would say do this: select screw retain restoration for vast majority if possible due to the retrievability. This is gonna save you a lot of headache in the future. So like I said, in our practice, almost 100% is screw retained. Okay. And cement restorations offer simplicity and good control of morphology, but should only be considered if no removal or no service of the restoration is anticipated in the future. Implant impression techniques, okay. When do I take impressions, first of all? Generally, maxillary, I take impressions three months after implant placement, okay? And mandibular, two months after implant placement. These are uh, implants that are placed into sufficient bone, okay? There's no uh, issue. But if I'm doing an immediate bone graft and implant, I'm gonna wait six months after that procedure, okay? Before I take impression. Objectives of implant impression, you want fine details, dimensional fidelity, and soft tissue uh, accuracy. So there's two uh, things that we have to consider. Uh, fixture level or ab abutment level. Okay, first let's look at the fixture or abutment level. We could take abutment level impression, uh, and to do that you have to use a specifically matched impression coping. It's a plastic cap that picks up connected to the abutment that you have in the mouth. And that would take impression of the abutment level. Uh, fixture level, use that coping connected into the abutment directly and then take a, a impression of that, okay? And then transfer it, that's the fixture level. Okay, do you use transfer or pickup technique? Okay, uh, open tray technique, which is the uh, pickup uh, technique, with pickup impression coping, which you can see on the bottom there, um, and that has three different uh, connections, hex, non-hex, and SCRP. I talked about that earlier. And to do that, you have to, the tray has to have a hole for screws of the pickup impression coping to extrude out to. This is impossible when patient has limited mouth opening, especially second molars, okay? So there's patients who can't open their uh, mouth very much. So if you try to put this in there, in the back, because it's so long, 
it's impossible to take impressions in the second molar area if the patient has limited opening. So let's go step by step. Uh, open tray technique pickup. So what you do is you put in the uh, pickup abutment here. Okay, you have a, a um, impression tray with a hole there cut out. What I do is I recommend you put a, a rope wax, a border wax, or an ortho wax, or anything where you made the hole. Okay, and this will help in getting a clean impression later. Okay, so. After that, you put in the impression and seat it down, and you have to have the, uh, the screws poking out of that impression tray. So if you had a, a, a wax there, all you would see is the um, screw uh, pushing out. You won't have all the goo of the impression coming out of here. And make sure that all the screws are showing through the hole. Okay? And then after it sets, you remove the uh, screw before you take out the uh, impression, because if you try to take out the impression without removing the screw, it's not gonna come out because it's fixed in there. And then after that, you put, it, you put on the um, lab analog onto the uh, pick, pick up uh, abutment and send it to the, the lab that way, and they'll pour out. Uh, open tray technique, this is a photograph how it's done, so you see on the, Upper left, the patient presents with the healing abutment. On the right, you put the pickup uh, abutment. Um, this is what I mean about not putting a wax in that hole. If you don't put a wax in, all this impression material comes out and it gets pretty messy. But if you just simply put a little rope wax where that hole was, it would hold that impression material, and make it much easier and cleaner, okay? Custom open tray pickup. You could have custom ones here with individual holes or a uh, wide window. The individual holes is to make sure the impression stays there and it's better accuracy supposedly. But nowadays it's usually just a slot there, a window. And we don't even use custom anymore. We just use stock plastic trays and just cut it out. Uh, much easier and cheaper, okay, Cheers time. And then you have the transfer technique. Uh, it's a close tray technique. Almost say that, same as conventional impression, you use transfer impression copings and second molar area with these transfer abutment, it can be a little bit difficult because it, this does have quite a, uh, some height to it. Okay. Um, this is how you do it. You put in the transfer abutment into the implant, and then you, what we recommend is putting a little wax on the top there where the hex hole was. This is so that there's no um, errors when you transfer this back into the impression later when you're take, uh, making a model, okay? Um, and then you take an impression, and then after the impression, you just pull it out, and then you take the uh, transfer abutment out of the patient's mouth, connect it with lab analog, and put it back into the impression, send that to the lab. Pros and cons of pickup impression. Pros, normally perceived as more accurate impression taking, uh, taking method. Con, open tray uh, technique, harder to handle, the total length of coping and guide pin because it's longer and not possible once again if patient has limited mouth opening. Pros and cons of transfer impression, pro easier to handle, closed tray, sim similar to just regular impression. Con, higher chance for a deformation perceived as less accurate. I think for our purposes, it's pretty accurate. Okay? Is this how you feel about it now? Um, let's go stress-free zone, okay? This is a new uh, a kit from, it's not so new, but it's new to implant industry, I think. It was uh, developed by Neobiotech first, and that's the only one. It's called the Neo Pick Cap Impression Kit. It looks colorful and stuff, but it's very simple. Pick, uh, Neo Pick Cap Impression Kit comes with a pick cap. That's the plastic cap that goes onto the transfer abutment. It's a closed tray technique and it incorporates pickup. The impression picks up these pick cap and so it's more accurate, okay? So let's see how it works. So you have these components, you put in the um, abutment and you put in a cap, take an impression, take a bite registration, and then get an accurate impression. There's different, uh, um, 
abutments for these. There's narrow body impression set. These are narrower, so usually used for the anterior, and they have different heights. These are for uh, to taking bite registrations. So if you have different heights, you could take bite registrations better, more accurately. And I'll show you what that means. And there's, there's wide, uh, um, large body impression caps. These will uh, form the emergence profile also better. So the main thing that I like about this thing, uh, kit is the positioner here. That's that middle um, handle there that allows us to control how we're gonna uh, position the abutment in the mouth. And it's friction fitted between the positioner and abutment, okay? So uh, really, I wish I was there to show you, but if you feel it a couple of times, it'll make sense to you. It's like life's changing in terms of impression taking, okay? You could do this with one hand. And this is step by step. After you put the uh, abutment in, you put the pick cap in, seat it, take impression, and the impression picks up the blue cap in, in the impression. And then you have this left, you take a bite this way. So this way, you you could do a bite very easily and you're gonna get an accurate bite here. And then you connect it with the um, lab analog put it back into the impression, snap, it snaps in, and then send that to the lab. Okay, final delivery of abutment. Um, you have an emergence profile. Careful attention to developing the proper emergence profile and the uh, definitive restoration will reduce not only plaque retentive areas, but also iatrogenic inflammation. So if you have a really wide emergence profile, that's gonna put pressure on the tissue and that could cause bone resorption, okay? There's no scientific data to show the definite, uh, definite geometric value of the emergence profile. It's all individual, so um, that, but yeah, emergence profile is very important, okay? What's gonna happen with the emergence profile? How will it affect our tissue, okay? So if we look at the buccal and lingual uh, soft tissue, when we under contour our, our uh, uh, emergence profile, as in the blue one, what it does is it'll cause the tissue to come toward the tooth, okay? Because there's less pressure. It ca uh, causes what's called creeping. But if you over contour, like in the yellow, what it does is it pushes the gum down, okay? So it pushes it uh, toward the apex or could cause more uh, gingival recession. Okay, how about between teeth, interproximal? How does that happen with contouring? So if you under contour, um, what happens is it lowers the inner dental papilla area because there's more room laterally. So the tissue will go down and toward the uh, uh, abutment. But if you over contour, what happens is it pushes the gum out, but because of the adjacent tooth there, the papilla will grow. It'll have the papilla come up. So if you know these, then you can kind of play with how the papilla shape is gonna behave when you're doing the final restoration, okay? So this is my restoration. I like that smooth transition. Um, if you look at the premolar on the anterior aspect, that's gonna push the soft tissue toward the inner proximal, so it's going to create more papilla okay toward the molar having that narrow on the base will have the tissue go up in this case and be more um, hygienic okay final delivery of abutment and crown for screw retain we tighten it down to 30 to 35 newtons per centimeter um, and then fill the access hole with Teflon and resin, okay? Cement, um, fill a screw hole with Teflon before you cement, then cement with dual cure cement such as Therasam or Unisam or whatever choice you have, okay? It's important that you protect the screw hole with some kind of things. Uh, before, we used to use um, cotton pellets a lot, 
And what you'll find that is if there's a little uh, loosening or something, um, bacteria will get in there and it makes the area smell really bad. Okay? When there's screw loosening, you take it out, it smells really bad. But if you have Teflon, it's much more solid. There's less screw loosening and also there's no um, bad smell when you take it out. Okay? So you have a, a screw retain here, access hole. We fill it in with Teflon and then you have to leave about two to three millimeter of space after you pack in the Teflon for composite space. Then I put in fill in composite and light care. Here, we talked about aesthetics. Here, you can see that it's not that visible and patients really don't complain very much, I find. Um, if later on it stains a little bit, they go, hey, I think I have a hole. And then you explain to them what that is, why that is, uh, usually they have no, no complaints. Okay. Um, for long-term success of implants, what do we need to uh, look at, okay? Two factors for long-term success. One is hygiene around implant for soft tissue health, having good keratinized gingival tissue is key. Prevent overload on implant, which affects hard tissue health, having balanced occlusion, okay? Those are basically main two things that you should focus on. Overloading factors, you could have excessive cantilever, which causes overload, parafunctional habits like bruxism, clenching. Um, if you notice any of that, then I recommend night guard with the, for the patients. Um, I find in our community, Korean community, almost everybody clenches or has bruxism. It's just because of our food diet. Uh, so I heavily recommend night guards, okay? If you have excessive occlusal force, it could cause overload, uh, excessive premature contact, that's obvious and then excessive cuspal inclination contact, and then poor, poor bone quality can cause overload. So how do you reduce bending moment in um, implant prosthesis? What you could do is reduce steep inclined contact area by flattening occlusal table right here on the blue. So the blue is the uh, bending moment, okay? When you put a lateral force like you see on the top, if there's a high inclination, steep inclination, it creates a longer bending moment, larger bending moment. By reducing that steep inclination on the picture on the right, on the bottom, B, what it does is it shortens the bending moment, okay? As you can see there. Also, you can narrow the occlusal table bucolingually, okay? You gotta check and adjust by, and you could use mylar, uh, uh, articulating paper and shim stock. Shim stock is the most accurate. Okay. So here I have a, a case where we're doing four implants. You could see that on the bottom patient in the past had is a clincher, right? It's all flat occlusion. Anyway, so we did a pick cap uh, impression, do the final uh, uh, prosthesis. We want group function, group function contact. And then if you could see, I flattened the occlusion again, okay? And then we would polish this down once everything's adjusted, but you wanna kind of flatten the occlusion. That uh, leaves a bending moment, okay? Or you could do slightly narrow occlusal table for lo less lateral force, okay? And then this is what you could do to check occlusal contact. When the patient bites down with light force, when you put the shim stock where the implant and the opposing tooth is, it'll slide out, okay? just gently slide out. Um, but if you have them bite down hard, the shim stock should just uh, stay there, okay? Um, what you wanna do is, especially for the second molar, because our jaw is a hinge joint, our second molar area takes the most force. That's why we see a lot of uh, crown fractures, um, porcelain fractures, cusp fractures on the second molars because it takes the most force. So if you put an implant against a natural tooth, the natural tooth is gonna lose out, okay? Um, so you wanna make it so that it's lighter contact back there, especially in the second molar area. And then uh, you want group function and for lateral excursive. And if it's a, a clincher, what I like to do is 
put light to no contact on the implant restoration on lateral obtrusive movement. So it's an anterior group function. Okay, you can do this. This is a, a upper premolar, you know, after you place an implant, you come back, healing above, my tissues heal great, looks great, put the pit cap impression there, put the cap, take the impression, put the crown back in, and it looks good, the tissue looks beautiful. Here, the access hose is barely visible, just do it, okay? And I know I went through that super fast and it might must be kind of confusing for a lot of you. Um, uh, so I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to go through that quick and now take any questions. All right, let's look at some questions here, okay? All right, um, thank you, Dr. Huang. Would you please share with what technique and instrument you use in order to perform atraumatic extraction on the front teeth, uh, uh, resist, uh, uh, a root with root canal? Thank you, okay. Um, I use, uh, what I use is, I first, after I get the patient, numb, I go with the Explorer, okay? <laughs> Believe it or not. We go with Explorer and go around the PDL and I cut the PDL, okay? And then you could use a periotome or um, uh, what is Luxator. Luxator uh, elevators are not the normal elevator where you put uh, rotational force. It's like a blade. Uh, they're a little bit more expensive, but it's like a blade. And what you do is just put it in the PDL, push it vertically down and it kind of cuts the PDL, and, and you don't want to push these around that much. Um, you want to cut the PDL and you push them gently, and the root usually just pops out, no problem. Okay, I hope that answers the question. And then in your last uh, webinar, you mentioned your fee was 25. That included surgical placement, restoration, or just surgery and extraction and uh, is extra. Okay. That's just the average. Uh, my implant cases depends on the case itself. If it's a difficult case, like anterior, I charge more. On the posterior, everything's beautiful. Um, I charge less, okay? To be honest, if you have a first molar uh, uh, with sufficient bone, I'm doing these implants in five minutes, and I know the success rate is gonna be high 90s, almost 100%. I could even go as low as like $1,500 for implant abutment and crown and still make money. So depends on the site um, condition. So some cases I've charged 5,000 or more um, and I've charged as little as, to be honest, $1,200 for everything, okay? But I charge, I break everything up, extraction, bone graft, um, abutment, crown, everything, and charge them separately, okay? But 2,500 is average in my uh, neighborhood. Okay, I noticed that you use little big size of the bone. What do you think about bone uh, powder uh, powder size when it comes to final result, especially front anterior area versus big bone size part? I use a mixture. I like uh, larger particles. Um, I use mixtures because I like the space that it creates between the particles for blood to flow in. And it also holds that shape better when you use a larger particle size. But it's not always um, the best thing to do in certain cases. But the case that you saw uh, an anterior, um, we already had a bony housing, so that was pretty good. Um, I just put in the lar larger particles in there so that blood can go in between. And actually, that is a mixture of uh, powder and uh, large particulate. Um, didn't quite show there, but yeah, I use a, a mixture, okay? And then um, next question, if patient is missing number 30, 31, shifted and tilted mesially, the placement of 30 will be parallel with 29 or 31, and how patient is going to manage an approximate cleaning? Yes, that happens a lot, and you have to make it parallel to 29, not 31, because 31 is uh, leaning. If you make that uh, parallel to the 31, you're gonna have issues with uh, delivery of the uh, prosthesis and also 
if you eventually lose 31, then the position of the implant for 31 will be compromised because the implant on 30 will be going into the 31 space. So you want to parallel to the mesial 29, always to the mesial. Whenever there's a missing tooth, you're going to parallel the implant with the mesial tooth. Okay, it doesn't matter where. Okay, okay, and how you can create wide, broad interproximal contact to prevent food impaction for case mentioned above. Okay, um, interproximal contact, yeah, wide contact is good, but um, what I find a lot of labs do is they cheat on that. They make it over contour where it wraps around the uh, adjacent tooth, and that's not a good thing. Initially, it seems like a good thing because um, it creates more broader contact, but I look for ideal ovoid shaped broad contact, okay? And toward the coronal portion. If you have the contact toward the gingival portion, then you could have more food impaction. But if you make the broad ovoid shaped contact toward the crestal uh, marginal ridge, I find that's the best, okay? And you don't want it over contour where it wraps around, okay? And Hi, doctor, do you have a protocol to design the soft tissue in the emergence profile? I think the over contour can help to grow up papillas, especially in uh, aesthetic zone. That's exactly true. So I was trying to tell you how your body's reacting to the emergence profile, and that's very important. And I wish I had more time to just show you and how, what the tissue does when we uh, push on it and pull on it and let it go. But emergence profile is very critical for aesthetic and uh, long-term um, success, okay? Uh, you want the tissue to be healthy and able to breathe. So if you over contour it, what happens is the pressure from the over contour pushes the tissue and causes pressure on the bone and the bone goes through biologic width uh, process uh, remodeling and you have uh, crustal bone loss. So um, that's something that we, I could go into more detail in the future. But yes, you could control the uh, a profile of the papilla and so forth by contouring the um, emergence profile. Can you briefly explain replacement of cement retained implant crown? How disastrous can, can it be? So replacement, it's not disastrous. It, it's just a little bit harder. Uh, but if, if it's an anterior, it's harder because usually the reason why you do cement retain in the anterior is because of the angulation position of the implant. You would have the access hole on the facial aspect. So uh, you can't take it off unless you destroy the crown. Um, so in that case, you have to make a new crown and so forth. But if it's in the posterior and the implant position is pretty uh, accurate, you could go right through by looking at the x ray, you could kind of estimate where the access hole should be. And you go through, cr cut through the uh, uh, cr uh, occlusal and access the screw. Would zirconia crown on upper first molar cause loosening of implant on mandibular first molar? Uh, what kind of occlusion you recommend on such a case? Or what kind of crown maxillary first molar you recommend? Okay, well, there's a lot of different materials, right? We have uh, horse PFM, um, uh, full gold, or zirconia as the main three main uh, uh, implant crowns. Um, PFMs look great, uh, but in the molar region, especially the second molar region, you take the risk of porcelain chip because of the force that it generates in the second molar area. Or even in the first molar, if you don't have a supporting second molar uh, area, then it's gonna create, use a lot of force, so porcelain can chip. Um, but it's still a great res a restoration, but that's the uh, uh, thing that you have to watch out for. Zirconia crowns are great. Um, advantage is that it's strong. It doesn't break very well, uh, but that's also the disadvantage. It's too strong sometimes. So 
against a natural opposing tooth or even implant tooth, you want it to be a lighter contact in the posterior. So just like I showed you with the shim stock, if you have a light, light bite where the anterior teeth are touching the back tooth, the molar, with the shim stock, it should just gently pull out. Not just easily pull out, but gently pull out, okay? And then when the patient puts force, like their chewing force, hard chewing force, it should grab it, okay? That's what I could recommend for you. Um, gold is the best because it's self-adjusting and very forgiving, but it's expensive, okay? And then, uh, oh, thank you, Dr. Patel. <laughs> and then, uh, and we'll make another, okay. I think I answered all the questions. Is there any questions that I did not answer? I'm not sure. Oh, wait a minute here. When you order a screw retained crown lab, do they fabric the crown upon on the neohead cement oven or tie base? Okay, I would not recommend tie base for uh, people, okay? Or the link, they call it the a link. The problem with the link is that the axial wall height is too short. Um, we find that over time, the, the retention between the link tie base and the restoration will fail. So you have that condition. It doesn't happen right away. It happens like years, year, two, three years, depending on what they're going through. But the problem with tie base the link is that it's too short. So I have stopped using tie base or the link completely. I don't recommend that. Use just stock abutment and you could ask, send the patient, um, the lab stock abutment and they could turn that into a screw retain. And I have the lab cement the crown in the lab and then send it to me as one piece. And that will save you a lot of time and cost. Okay. Um, I hope that answered it. Uh, anything else? I think uh, I answered all the questions. Um, yeah, doctor. Um, I think you answered all of these questions. Um, is there anything else you like to mention before before I move on to the announcement? No, I think I'm good. I want to say thank you to everybody. But um, I just did three lectures uh, on sinus and then basic part one, basic part two. Uh, this is my website, I mean, my email address, ask me any questions, and I, this is, I, uh, I had a lot of patients, or not a patient, a lot of doctors asked me for a webinar um, and uh, 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 privately and stuff, and we could do that too. So if you contact me with Zoom, we could talk about it and have a uh, little class review and stuff too, little more smaller classes also where we could all talk like in a Zoom meeting, okay. All uh, right, thank you very much, doctor, um, for your presentation. And now I will just quickly move on to the uh, announcement. All right, so first one, stay connected with us on social media. Um, as we, as I mentioned, our Facebook page is right here, Neobiotech USA, and Instagram page is Neobiotech underscore USA, and the YouTube is Neobiotech USA. So follow us also in, on our social media. And if you are interested in taking our webinars, you can find upcoming webinars on our website. Here is www.neobiotechusa.com and click on webinar at the top and then you'll be on our webinar page. And we will have in another week, another webinar today at two, two o'clock uh, in Pacific Coast time the topic on the all on x treatment planning, surgical and restorative sequencing with Dr. Owen Trin. So here's the time at 2 p.m. at um, Pacific Coast time. And we also have another, uh, we also have two webinars every Mondays and Thursdays. So uh, to, uh, and next week we will have another uh, Mondays, one in the morning from 11 to 12 and one in the afternoon from 2 to 3 p.m. And this is the next week's webinars you can see right here. 
So the first one is on Monday, uh, May 25th on guided implant surgery system with Dr. Spencer Park. And on the same day at 2 p.m. with Dr. Van Smiler on session one of the planning and surgical for extra maxillary zygoma implants. And then the following Thursday uh, with Dr. Um, Van Smiler on the session two will be um, on session two in the, uh, the in the morning, 11, and then the same day on Thursday at two o'clock with Dr. Mike Chat on the fundamental of rich augmentation with GBR. So save, save, please save all these dates on your calendar. And also these courses are first conference third basis. So register in advance and reserve your spot. And also you can watch previous webinars on our website. So just click on the previous webinar right here at the top and you will watch all these previous webinars if you miss some of these great lectures uh, on this page right here, it's all free. And thank you so much for those who doctors who stayed until the end. And also as part of our ongoing effort to provide a better continuing education courses, we would like to request your feedback via a short course evaluation. And one of our sales rep will email you this link to complete. And after you receive it, please fill it out all these questions and submit it as soon as possible because you will receive your C open completion of this course evaluation form. And this form should take no longer than five minutes to complete. It's very simple. And the form should look like this and there should be more questions in the bottom. And I wanna say thank you again for participating in today's webinar. And I hope to see you again um, at two o'clock, 2 p.m. today. And so feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Here's my email, ayong.chuy at neobiotechusa.com. And if you have any further questions in regard to today's uh, webinar topics or um, other topics related to Dr. Huang's webinar, then you could also email to uh, Dr. Huang. Uh, his email is on his screen, <laughs> on his right, I think, yeah. So um, I also want to say thank you, Dr. Huang, again <laughs> for, your, um, for your lecture today. And I hope all the doctors have a wonderful rest of your day and hope you see you at 2 p.m. today. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, doctors. Thank you. Bye-bye. And I will end this webinar. Right.